Um, let's move to this story. Uh, Donald Trump has dismissed comparisons of him and his supporters to Nazis, declaring he's the opposite of a Nazi. The criticism followed his rally at New York's Madison Square Garden, which has been likened to a 1939 pro-Nazi rally held in the same venue. Commodore Harris, meanwhile, has been caught in a hot mic moment, admitting her campaign is struggling with male voters with just over a week to go until election day. Let's speak with Richard Johnson, senior lecturer in US politics, Queen Mary University, London. Um, Richard, good afternoon to you. Now, I mean, it's, I guess, one of the only thing worse than maybe being called a Nazi by your opponents is perhaps to have to stand on stage and deny that you are one. I'm not sure which one in this story is most damning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that this uh, particular charge is very useful for the Harris campaign to be making. You know, of course, there can be an, an academic debate over this and historical comparisons can be drawn. But uh, from the perspective of motivating people to vote for Harris over Trump, I think that the focus ought to much be more on the policies that uh, Harris is offering and to present a, a positive and optimistic uh, vision for her campaign. And I do wonder if comments like this have uh, echoes of Hillary Clinton's uh, basket of deplorables line in 2016, which mm. ended up uh, giving a sense that uh, the Clinton campaign held many of Trump's voters in contempt. Sure. And I, I, I think that it's probably not wise political strategy from the from the Harris campaign. Uh, what was interesting, and I guess this is largely a side point to the, the, the bigger narrative which you, you responded to there, um, why a TV channel decided to kind of jump in on this as well and say, uh, look, you remember Madison Square Garden back in 1939? Look, that's what happened here. And then they showed some black and white footage of a convention where there were Nazis there doing Nazi salutes and goose-stepping, whatever it's called. Um, I, why do you think a TV channel needed to go there? I mean, that particular venue, as you know, Obama has held a rally there. The Democrats have been there dozens of times. I mean, it's just a well-known venue. Well, yes, Madison Square Garden is one of the most iconic venues in the United States. Yeah. And... Uh, Trump has long wanted to hold a rally there as a as a New Yorker, as someone who appreciates spectacle. And this was something that he wasn't really able to do in the closing weeks, or really at all in the 2020 campaign because of restrictions due to COVID. So in, in some ways, I think Trump sees this as, as, as overdue. Mm. Uh, obviously, there are these remarks made by the comedian about Puerto Rico, which have somewhat overshadowed the yeah. event. But it was, I think, for the Trump campaign, what they were trying to project was a sense of confidence and an upbeat air about the campaign. And holding it in one of America's most iconic venues was surely the reason uh, why they chose it there, not because of uh, what had happened there in, in 1939. In terms of the Puerto Rico moment, shall we call it. This is where the comedian uh, Tony Hinchcliffe described Puerto Rico as an island of garbage. Now, it wasn't Trump that said it. It was a comedian after all. I mean, we, we all make gags about certain parts of geography in our own countries. Uh, does that... I'm seeing people on social media. I know that's not exactly the, 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 the best place to go for uh, a true litmus test of, of what might happen. But I am seeing people say this was genuinely a very dangerous moment for Trump because he will lose voters as a result of a comment like that. Yeah, I'm interested to see how it plays out because on the one hand, yes, it was offensive and it does seem to be getting a, a good amount of pickup in the media and from what I gather also in Spanish language uh, media in, in the US. Mm. On the other hand, uh, there have been many times where uh, offensive things have been said at uh, Trump rallies over the years and it's not really shifted the dial very much. Uh, this is a very polarized electorate um, in, in general, the American electorate. And we shouldn't really expect, I think, at this point, voters to be changing their minds very much about the candidates. I feel, yeah. I feel like you, most voters have already firm, 
uh, formed quite a firm opinion about the candidates, especially Trump. I mean, Harris, I think, has had a bit more time to try and introduce or reintroduce herself to the electorate. But I think people already now know what they feel about Trump and the comments of this past weekend. I, I'm not sure really going to change many minds. Yeah, I guess that, that it, it's only perhaps slightly um, interesting because we're talking about a swing state here. Democrats won by a margin of 1.17 per cent or something just over 80,000 votes. So, you know, if somebody is going into the the ballot box, into the, the voting hall that day, uh, they might remember a comment like that. But as you rightly said, I mean, I think most people have made their mind up, haven't they? Yeah, you're right. I mean, in an election like this one, which we expect to be so close, any little marginal shift could make a difference. Um, I mean, we're it's an extraordinary thing that uh, the polling averages in the seven swing states are basically all within the margin of error. And mm. predicting this election is like flipping a coin seven times sure. and then doing it again and, and trying to, you know, figure out what, what's going to happen. Um, I, I think that it is possible that if it was very close and these comments caused a couple thousand uh, Puerto Ricans to stay at home and, and and Pennsylvania was going to be decided by that tiny margin. Of course, that can make a difference. But at, when it becomes that close, the weather can make a difference. You know, I mean, anything can true. make a difference. Yeah, true. Uh, but you've got to win Pennsylvania if you're Trump, right? Uh, he, he does need... Um, so he doesn't necessarily need Pennsylvania. If he wins North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona um, and Nevada then he needs to win either Pennsylvania or Michigan or Wisconsin. He just needs one out, of, one out of the three. If he wins Pennsylvania and Georgia, then he can afford to lose nearly all of the other yeah. swing states. So um, Pennsylvania is a very key and pivotal state. There is a path for him to win without it, but it's tricky. Yeah. Um, and just a final word, Kamala Harris uh, apparently caught on hot mic uh, saying that her campaign is struggling to uh, attract male voters. Uh, I mean, that's not really a big surprise. Trump does tend to command greater support from male voters, so maybe that sort of explains it. But it's interesting to hear it said out loud from one of the candidates. Yeah, it's interesting that the gender divide has received a lot of attention in this campaign, but I was looking back at uh, historic uh, exit polls and we haven't actually this election the gender divide is quite similar to what it has been in the past so okay. i was looking at 2012 in in 2012 um obama won 55 percent of vote of women and harris is polling about 55 percent with women uh, mitt romney won 52 percent of men trump is polling about 54 percent with men so just slightly yeah. uh, more but but not that much so um, I think what's happened is that younger voters, there's a bigger divide among younger voters now, and there's um, less, and that's sort of then compensated by older women moving more to the right um, as younger women are moving to the left. Um, so the aggregate, the overall difference isn't, isn't there, but there is some churn, generationally mm. speaking, uh, between, the, um, between the genders uh, underneath the surface. Got it. Richard, thank you, sir. Uh, great to get your analysis on this. Richard Johnson is a senior lecturer in US politics, Queen Mary University in London. And I just wonder if you were the kind of... You know, if you came at this, you suddenly arrived in America and you got the vote and you're watching two candidates you don't know much about. Uh, this is the first you've ever heard of Donald Trump or Kamala Harris. And you, you watch a couple of the bulletins and watch some of the rallies and some of the key speeches. I think you would vote for Donald Trump every day of the week, wouldn't you? Based on that, if you were basing it on that, just trying to hoover up a bit of basic knowledge, a litmus test of the, you know, the support, the spirit, enthusiasm or excitement. I mean, if you... With Trump, at least you sense that it's a bloke with a big idea. Now, you can't... That's not a get-out-of-jail card for Trump, by the way, because when you analyse ideas, you're often in a... And, and try to really get into the detail of ideas. Sometimes you discover there's not a lot there. But he's a bloke with a, a big message. You know, I'll make things great again is huge. And it worked for him the first time around. I'm on your, I'm the man that speaks your language, OK? I'm with you, all right? I might be a squillionaire, doesn't matter. I know what you're going through. I'm with you. And that counts for an awful lot. Now, whether you believe him or not is another matter. But 
if you were objectively just trying to analyse both and then you looked at Kamala Harris, you'd think, well, what the hell does she stand for? I have no idea what she stands for. Absolutely none at all. It's like listening to a child in comparison to Trump when it comes to those big moments. Now, of course, politics, if you want to get really serious and in-depth about it, isn't about celebrity, it isn't about sound bites, it shouldn't be about headlines, it shouldn't just be about who's the bigger character. It's deeper and more intelligent than that, or it should be. So I understand that as well, but I think if you're coming in it thinking, I'm not sure which one to go for, you might just go for the guy with a big idea, and I, which is why I think Trump sounds and looks the better candidate, but I just wonder whether they're going to come out the woodwork and just go, Do you know what, uh, it might be a risk, let's go Harris, we'll, we'll you know, squeeze our nose, close our eyes and go Kamala.